here in just a few. Go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Practical RDA, A Beginning, which is aimed to be an introduction to RDA for those who are cataloging. My name is Denise Garofalo. I'm a librarian down at Mount St. Mary College in Newburgh, New York, and I'm going to be your RDA host for this webinar. Before we get started, um, I just want to uh, remind you, you should have received three handouts um, that go along with the webinar that uh, one says RDA equals resource description and access and gives some background information. Another one says it might be RDA if and gives you some hints on how to identify an RDA record. And the third one is titled RDA tips and pointers and just does some um, information, the differences between um, our previous cataloging code, AECR2, and RDA. So those three handouts you should have. So let me get started here. Um, what I hope to go over with you folks is a little background into RDA, cover some terminology and concepts, um, the anatomy of it, how to identify RDA when you see it, some things to keep in mind when you're cataloging with RDA and applying it. So that's uh, hopefully what you're going to take away from our session this afternoon. Now, in the library world, RDA stands for Resource Description and Analysis, and it's something that inspires fear with many librarians. You may ask why, but I th there's just one word that's really behind the sphere, and it's change. RDA means a change in how we as catalogers think about cataloging. The fundamental difference is the focus on the intellectual content first, and the carrier and format are secondary. And that's really the big change. With RDA, it's not so much that what we're dealing with is a DVD or an ebook or a paperback, but more about is it the Lord of the Rings or is it Hamlet? The relationship between content and creators is more integral to cataloging under RDA. And where AACR2, the previous cataloging code, um, Anglo-American Cataloging Rules, second edition, was rules, RDA is instead guidelines. And the bottom line with RDA is enhancing the user access. Because seriously, if users can't find the content, then what good is the library to them? Now, something else that kind of works hand in hand with RDA is Ferber the functional requirements for bibliographic records. And they, we're just going to delve a little bit into Ferber, um, some basics uh, to help our understanding of RDA. We're not going to go in depth, um, but something to, to keep in mind that's a key aspect of this is um, the importance for the bibliographic information to answer user needs. And to answer those needs, there's four key concepts that form the basis of Ferber. The work, the expression, the manifestation, and the item. So in order to kind of get a grasp on these, we're going to think of the Star Wars universe and, and all the various materials we may or may not have in our libraries that, that's Star Wars. With Ferber, an author or a creator imagines, develops, and creates a work. So in this case, Star Wars. That work is then realized by an expression of that intellectual effort. So working from the top down, um, we see the work is on top, and the expression is the embodiment of the work. In this case, there's the 1977 original release of the movie, and then the re-release of the improved version in 1997 is another expression. Then in Ferber talk, they would say expressions are the embodiment embodied in a manifestation. Manifestation is the collection that encompasses all of the items that were produced. So with Star Wars, there's the, the movie, there's the Blu-ray, and the VHS, and the DVD, and so on. Those are all manifestations. Under Ferber, 
the item is the object that we can hold and observe. They say the manifestation is exemplified by a single item that has been acquired by the library and appears in the library catalog. So with this example, items would be your DVD disc or your VHS tape, or if it was a streaming media, that would be the item. So that's our very brief walk into Ferber. It's more, most importantly, remember those four terms, um, the work, the expression, the manifestation, and the item, because you will see some of that terminology in some RDA records. So keep that in the back of your mind. Now, talking about our RDA and the catalog, remember that our, the objective of our catalogs is to either find or locate a specific resource, or to collate sets of resources that belong to the same work, like all the Star Wars stuff, or the same expression, the 1977 original release of the movie, or is it the later re-release? Um, the manifestations, whether it's the Blu-ray, the beta, um, the VHS, or whatever, and then right down to the items that are sitting on your shelf in the library. Or the catalog is used to find everything that a library owns or has access to on a particular subject. Or all the Korean language materials. Or all the new materials. And this isn't anything new. What we're talking about here is what catalogers have been doing all along. But it's how we think about what we do that has changed under RDA. One of the changes under RDA is the terminology that we catalogers use. Instead of headings, with RDA, they talk about access points. And instead of talking about the author, it's the creator. Now, given that libraries hold materials beyond just books, moving away from book-centric terminology does make sense. An access point also kind of follows through more with the fact that we have a more online world and, and we have access points rather than card catalog headings. So just again, a change in how we think about what we do. One of the things that um, changed with RDA is the elimination of the GMD or general material designator. This has been viewed as revolutionary by many catalogers. Why, you might ask? Well, they tell me that patrons can't tell if a title is a book or a video recording or a sound recording without seeing that GMD in the title field. But I wonder if it's more that the librarians are comfortable with the GMD and would prefer to see it added back into the record. I know librarians who modify RDA records to include this eliminated subfield. But let's look at what replaced the GMD in an RDA record. We have three new fields, and they provide a lot more information on just what type of content, what device may be needed to access that content, and what form the carrier or package for the content may take. That's a lot more information than just seeing video recording. So on, on this example, in the 336, you can see it's a two-dimensional moving image, i.e. a movie. The 337 tells us what kind of device is needed, some sort of a video device. And 338 tells us it's a video disc rather than, say, a videotape. So that, that is more information than just seeing video recording. But it's something that, that people are not comfortable with today. These are the kinds of... Um, information that you could see in a typical 336 field. It's going to tell us if the content is an image, a book, if it's a sound recording, is it an audiobook or a musical performance. Now, personally, I think that that change alone, being able to, to see that it's a spoken word versus a performed music CD, is, is very helpful for the user. It lets them know more about the content of a particular sound recording rather than just the word sound recording. But I may, I may stand alone on that, but that's my feeling. 
In this new 337 field, it provides information on what type of device you need in order to access the content. So in the case of a print book, where no device is needed, you would see the term unmediated. But for other content, you can ascertain if it's an audio device or a video device and so on that you need for accessing the content, depending on what information you see in this particular field. And the last of the three new fields for um, talking about the content um, in RDA is the 337. And that tells us the container or the package that the content is in. So in the case of a print book, it's a volume. This slide has a selection of the terminology that you might see in this field. As you can see, it's quite varied, and it depends on what content it's related to. And there's, they've even thought about things for the future with the category unspecified. I'm not quite sure what you would put in there, but it's there to give us that option. So I mentioned that people are a little uncomfortable with the lack of a GMD, the general material designator, in the records. So what would some of these records look like um, with RDA? An example. So this is what the MARC record fields for a non-print work, in this case a streaming video, would look like. So these should, some of the fields are familiar. You, should, you have the 300 field, which describes the work. Um, and then you have the 336, which provides information on the content. Again, it's, it's a video. The 337, the type of device to access it. Well, this is a streaming video, so you would need some sort of computing device. The 338 is the carrier or package. Well, this is an online resource, so there really isn't one, and that's the information that you find here, that it's an online resource. And then the 856 fields where you find the access links and information about this particular streaming video are there. So those should be familiar to anyone who has seen streaming video records um, prior to RDA. The only thing that's changed is those three new fields that we see giving us a little bit more information about our content. Another change in how we as catalogers or people who work in cataloging think about and perform those tasks is in regards to how we record information when we are cataloging. Under AACR2, catalogers would adjust or correct the information that they entered into a record. With RDA, we are to transcribe the information and not correct it. We, what we see is what we put into the record. We can provide additional access points under, say, a corrected misspelled typing, but we don't correct the title as we enter it in the 250 field, 245 field. We would add a 500 field and perhaps an additional title access point with the corrected title, but we would not make that change in the title field for the record if, if we have a misspelling. There's other, there's other fields besides the title field that you transcribe. Um, and this slide tells us which areas we are supposed to transcribe um, when we are doing our cataloging. So if there's a typo in the title or in the series, we enter it as we see it. And then we provide that additional access point or a note that has the correct spelling. Um, in, under AACR2, we would provide the correct spelling, say, in the title, and then we would have a note on how we saw, actually found it on the item. So we're doing the same thing, just in a different order. It's a change, and we're not here to correct things. We are here to describe them as we find them under RDA. Again, changes in how we think. And this is another change in how we think about cataloging. And it involves where we locate the information we need for cataloging. Under AACR2, there were specific locations where we were to look to find the elements we needed for cataloging, such as the title and the publication. 
if we found that information in other places than where we were supposed to specifically find it, we were supposed to indicate that in our catalog record by either a note saying, you know, title found on title, a back of title page, or we would place the information in square brackets within the MARC record. So if you were cataloging under AECR2 and you were cataloging a video, if you were following the rules under AACR2, you were not to use the packaging that that video came in, or the DVD, but were instead placing, that, um, placing it into the video device, watching it, and pulling the title, producer, date, and so on from the actual video frames. I know that in most places, no one had the time to do that, and they were cataloging it off the packaging. But the actual rules say we are supposed to watch the video under ACR2 and then catalog from what we see on the screen. RDA, a change in how we do that. Um, it's Remember, RDA is guidelines and not rules. So although it would be preferred to view the video so that you know that you're actually getting the right information because that's the source. Under RDA, you can use the packaging and you do not have to use square brackets or make a note that you found it on the packaging. The only time you might use the square brackets is if, for instance, you went to the distributor's website because you, you couldn't find any information on the packaging about the video and you went to the, their website and got the information. Then you could use square brackets. Except when we're dealing with sound recordings because they're special um, and you are to use the label on the sound recording even if the package has information. I, I have a uh, sinking, sneaky um, suspicion, I mean, that the people involved in RDA had a, an overabundance of music catalogers because there seems to be guidelines that are for everything else except certain things with music. But I'm not a music cataloger, so uh, there, there may be things outside my realm of information, but it just seems that way when you, you look at things about RDA. Another thing with um, RDA is when you are completing the physical description, um, you substitute the term audio for the term sound, except for soundtrack reels. So where we would normally say that um, it, we're dealing with a compact disc, that it's a sound disc, or if we're dealing with a, a, an audio cassette, that it's a, a sound cassette, we are using the term audio. So a CD would be an audio disc, not a sound disc under RDA. Um, the reason given was that sound caused confusion with the content, whereas audio is a little bit, a little more precise. Um, I'm not sure, but that's the way we're supposed to use it, so that's one of the changes that we have with RDA. As I mentioned, with, with, um, there's some specific details that relate to sound recording catalog under RDA in regards to describing specific aspects of the content. Um, so these are details that you provide, um, whether it's in analog or digital, what kind of recording medium, um, the playing speed, um, special characteristics, is it Dolby, is it an MP3? So these are things that when you're dealing with sound recordings and cataloging them with our RDA, that you may have to spend a little bit more time with than you did under AACR2. Now, regarding translations, the process is pretty much the same um, as it was under ACR2, and here's an example. So you have the, the creator in the 100 field. The 240 is what we know as a, a uniform title. So it's the, the title in the original language that the, the work was published in. And then the 245 field is the title of the item that you are cataloging, in this case, the English translation of that Spanish title. So that's pretty much the same as, as under um, ACR2. So some things haven't changed with RDA. With corporate entries, um, as, as is everything with RDA, we spell out abbreviations. And 
what I found interesting is that um, there was a rule included in AACR2 that we were supposed to be spelling out the word department, but no one applied it, so it was still abbreviated. But under RDA, we spell out things, no abbreviations, so we, we spell out department. And then if you happen to deal with treaties, um, they've made a little change in how we treat treaties um, when we're cataloging them. So that's a little bit of a change with RDA under corporate entries. Another little bit of a change in, in how we um, deal with a, an entry is the Bible, holy books. Um, with RDA, remember, we're, we are user focused. So removing abbreviations makes sense. So you're not going to see O period, T period for Old Testament and N period, T period for New Testament with the Bible. You're going to spell them, spell out those words. And um, the Quran with a K has been replaced by Quran with a Q. So a little bit of a change in how that heading is formatted under RDA. And there's a few other changes with the Bible entries. So this slide kind of gives it an overview. So you'll see the um, abbreviations are spelled out. And if you are dealing with just a particular book in the Bible, you no longer indicate if it is an Old Testament book or a New Testament. You just put the, the name of the work. So that's a little bit of a change between AACR2 and um, RDA. And that's kind of an overview of some of the major things that we might be dealing with, um, with with RDA, but we're going to go into a little bit more depth in anatomy. So I talked about that with authors, we now call them creators. So just as we've always done, you if you have more than one author, it, the entry is under the first creator. Does it not matter how many are listed? Only one can go into that 100 field. And then any additional ones can go into the 700 fields. Um, some folks followed a rule of three. So if five people wrote uh, a book, they would only have listings for the three. But with RDA, it's about user access and being able to find materials. So you really should create an entry for anybody who was involved in creating that particular um, item that you're dealing with. And that's why you might notice with um, records for things like movies that you see a whole lot more 700 added access points for all of the actors and the producers, people involved with the music and so on, um, just so that, that users will be able to find um, all of the things that um, you know, Harrison Ford has acted in, um, whether or not they're aware of all of the movies that, that he has done. So it's just, just a, a change in, in thinking about why we are cataloging. It's to put the item in the user's hands so the user can find it. Um, another thing that's changed is with uniform titles, which you'll see in translations, in um, music, um, and in, in uh, groupings, like in this this particular um, example on the slide, you're not going to be using selections as a collective title. If you have a, a book that contains three or more works by someone, um, you, you use the works and then the subfield selections. With languages, we only have one language in the uh, uniform title, subfield L for languages. We don't use the term polygot with RDA if there's three or more languages. We don't put in dual languages. That's a, a change thinking about making it a little bit more precise. And then for music uniform titles, we use cello. It's a change. Again, I'm not a music cataloger. I'm not sure of the genesis of that, but that is the rules as, as they stand if you do music cataloging. When we talk about the statement of responsibility, 245 field. Um, we're supposed to again transcribe everyone that's listed regardless of the number. Um, there's a lot of discussion in RDA about the difference between uh, compilations and, and collective works. Um, you then can just transcribe um, multiple statements of responsibilities in the 505 if you have a, a large compilation. Big change in how we think about the
not include the doctor. You would not include any affiliations, degrees, or titles. Um, now, if it appears on the item, then we transcribe it, so we will include that. Um, if if uh, there is a lot of creators, you can consider omitting those affiliations, because sometimes you'll see an author and it will say what, you say university or a law firm that or school district in a textbooks case um, that they're affiliated with. Strictly following RDA, you would include all of that on your 245 subfield C, all of those um, names and their affiliations. But if there's a lot of names and a lot of affiliations, it can look confusing. So you can consider omitting them. Because again, remember, we're dealing with guidelines um, rather than rules. And there's no required correlation between what you put in a 245 and the 500, the note fields, and the access points. You could have what's called untraced authors, say, in your description, but you don't provide them a 700 field and an access point. There is no minimum number of authors that have to be transcribed and accessed. Um, that's a change. And I think the idea that giving some of this power to the catalogers, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so it will be different from library to library. You understand your community, your library, your users. You will be best able to decide what is going to work best so that your users can find the materials in your library. Um, one of the things that they did change with RDA, though, is that if there is a noun phrase associated with the author to include it in the subfield C, kind of goes along with that transcribing. So um, here's how you might find it, whether you, you might see that it says by Gora Vidal, and you're supposed to include that in your 245. If it doesn't say by, then you don't include that word. So we, we see it, we transcribe it, we don't see it, we don't include it. Now, here's the difference between um, some AACR2 um, statements of responsibility and some RDA statements of responsibility. If I found on the left um, the people who were responsible for the content, i.e. the authors, in a place other than the title page, under AACR, AACR2, I would enclose that information in square brackets. It was taken from the verso. But under RDA, as long as I found it on the item, doesn't matter where, I can include it without putting those square brackets in. So, because besides really, when we think about our users, we understand what those square brackets meant, but our users had no idea. So it's, it's kind of keeping our, the idea that our catalog records are for our users' benefit, not ours in our forefront of our mind when we're cataloging. And here's, um, under ACR2, you would omit titles and extraneous information. So if you look on the right-hand side under RDA, the book actually says that the foreword by some, is by someone who is deceased. Under ACR2, we would omit that information. But again, with RDA, we transcribe. So if there are titles or extra information, we put it on our statement of responsibility. It's not for us to decide. It's to provide our users with more information. Following that whole idea of transcribing rather than um, editing with additions, we don't abbreviate. That's an RDA thing. So we, we stay away from abbreviations. Um, but if the item itself says ed period rather than spelling out the word edition then that's what we're going to put on our records and that can result in double periods which look a little odd in a mark record but if the item itself says you know fourth ed period and it's the end of the field so you add another period you end up with double periods and sometimes people feel they have to edit that because it does look a little funky, but it's actually following the guidelines. I know it's strange, but that's the way it is. Another thing with RDA is using the actual copyright and phonogram symbols or signs um, rather than a small C or a small P when you're cataloging. 
Um, alternately, you can spell out the two words if you are unable to, to get those symbols into your records. But we are not supposed to use the small c and the small p anymore. Um, that's, that's an RDA uh, thing, again, trying to, to get more with the transcribing. Following along with that, we've actually um, eliminated the old 260 field, which was a place of publication, with the 264 field, which is repeatable. So you can have um, the most common is the 264 with the one indicator, um, which in indicates where, the, where it was published, who published it, and when. Um, you can estimate a publication year if it's lacking, if you can find information elsewhere. Um, and if you are going to use that copyright sign, it's supposed to be in its own field, which is the 264 indicator 4, which would look like this. And they say you should assign that only if the copyright year differs from the publication year. Um, so if if, for instance, it's copyright 2016, but it's published in 2017, the 2017 would be in its own field with this indicator of 1, and you would have an indicator 4 field with a 264 that included the copyright sign and the copyright year. So that's a little different in how we think about um, our place of publication. But the multiple 264 fields allows us to better tell our users where it was published, who distributed it, rather than having that whole string of information that we used to see in, in the old 260 fields. So here's some examples. <clears throat> so you have um, the copyright date. Oh, I have 261 instead of 264 on the slide. My apologies. Um, you see that the copyright date without the symbol is still in its it's a separate one. It's not in the indicator 4 in the first example because I don't have the copyright symbol there. Um, and you notice uh, I've given you what's on the source. Um, so I'm able to indicate who distributed it, although I don't know in the second example where it was published, who published it or when. I know when it was distributed and by whom, so I can include that information separately. And again, with RDA, we don't use any abbreviation or Latin, so that's why I'm spelling out in that second example um, the phrase place of publication, not identified, publisher not identified, and date of publication not identified. Again, giving more information to our user and not having them have to know Latin to understand what's going on with, with the uh, item. For ebooks, um, Here's how you might have your public publication, so to speak, information. If you have a print version of an ebook, and then aggregators of ebooks. So if you have OverDrive, who provides your ebooks, or um, EBSCO host, you would put that information kind of like a distributor, but it, it's the aggregator of the ebooks. So RDA has kind of thought about how to do that and provided a separate way to pull that information out so that you can show it in your MARC record. And if you happen to loan equipment and have to catalog it, um, you can use that same field for di the distributor for the maker of the equipment. So if you loan Kindles or backhoes or like some of one of the libraries in, in my area actually loans fishing rods, um, you have a place to put some of that information that sometimes in cataloging, you. you can seem a, a little bit uh, forced under the old rules. And here's some examples of um, this idea with our 300 fields of whether or not we're going to see a period or no period at the end. Now, with cataloging, there's something called ISBD, International Standard Bibliographic Display, or description, pardon me. And the display of that is what you see on this slide where there's spaces it indicates that we have spaces after the semicolon before the semicolon where we put our periods and so on um, but when we're thinking of the mark record they say that the series statement and the physical description 
are part of the same paragraph. So a period is needed after the 300 field to separate it from our 490 fields. Um, and if there isn't a 490 field, then the 300 field is in a paragraph by itself. Therefore, it needs no ending punctuation. So that's why you may see RDA records where the 300 field does not have a, a period. Now you would think on that first example, the 426 pages, that there should be a period after the CM because CM is an abbreviation for, for, for centimeters. At least that's what I always thought. But I learned that with RDA, CM is considered like, like a symbol, which seems odd to me, but that's the way it's it's considered under the RDA guidelines and therefore does not need a period after it. So some of these things, again, require us to change the way we think about what we do. And some people are a little better about stuff than that. This one's one that bothers me. I have to always kind of hesitate when I'm creating a record to think, now do I put a period after the CM? I may have to check the rules on that one. So it's, it's one of those things that uh, you may have to keep going back to yourself. Um, now, here's something if you are an academic library or you have some dissertations or thesis collection, they have some new subfields so that you can actually um, indicate what degree they're getting from what institution and, and what year it is. So you have the pattern shown first and then the second 502 field is an example of what it would look like. So someone got, um, there's a thesis in the collection, they got their MBA from Oxford and the date that they got it. So it does provide a little more information for the user, which follows along with RDA um, thinking. And we have um, some change with the bibliography and index notes. Um, the 504 field we used to see would have this phrase includes bibliographic references and index. Now we've split it out. The index, if it has one, gets its own field. The bibliography gets its own field. So that's a little different change with RDA. We have um, the person is added access point, the 700 field. Um, now you're required to transcribe the first author who would go into the 100 field. Um, if there's a translator of poetry, or an illustrator for children's material. You, you are required to transcribe those, but you can add entries for all of them. And again, keep in mind, we're trying to match the user with the content. The more access points we can provide them, the better. Now, you may be um, familiar with some of these relator terms. You could have seen them in, in records that have come out under RDA, um, actor, I, I know I've seen actor, I've seen um, author, choreographer, composers, um, but here are some other terms that you might see, and there are more. This is uh, a list of some of the more common ones that you can see. And again, it's, it's supposed to give not just us library folk, but our users an idea of why this person is attached to this particular item. You know, if they're the illustrator or they were the director it gives their role in, in involved in creating the particular work. Another thing that uh, sometimes gets people hung up is how to deal with um, multi-part works. So if you have um, a, a television series, you're supposed to use a title that you see um, for the part of the television program. In this case, we know that the episode is the transporter malfunction, and that's how we would use that as the title for this particular one. If there's only a general term like season four, season two, part 12, then you would include that. Um, so it would be Big Bang Theory, season four. I'm sure you've seen some of these, as, as a lot of the libraries do have various television shows in their collections, things that their users like. What if you have um, a sequence of, of consecutively numbered parts, but they're only identified by a general number, like the Thornbirds episode one and two, 
then that's what you would use for your title. So it's actually kind of common sense when we think about cataloging the titles and such under um, RDA. If they're unnumbered or non-consecutively numbered, oh dear me, I forgot to turn my phone off. I'm sorry um, for that interruption there. I was better last time. Um, anyway, they, you can use the term selections if you have non-consecutive numbered parts of a work or unnumbered parts, just a grouping of, of a variety of, of episodes, they can be considered selections when you're cataloging it. So Big Bang Theory selections would be the title. Other things thinking about personal names, whether they're in the 100 fields or the 700 fields, are these are the core elements. So you have the preferred name, their title if there is one, when they were born, when they died, if there's any other designations. You can include professions. It's an option. Um, you, you might see those in some of the uh, records that you have in your catalog. And then uh, the identifier, are they the author? Are they the director? Are they the um, uh, producer? And with AECR2, uh, again, you'll see on the right left-hand side, there's a lot of abbreviations. But with RDA, we spell those things out. Again, with the user in mind, we want to make sure that we spell things out so they don't have to guess what's going on. Another thing that we had with AACR2 was the fuller form of the name. And if they had a middle, middle name and they used their middle initial, then we would include a subfield Q that spelled out both their first name and middle initial. Because we transcribe, it's what we find on the item. That's what we use for the creator's name. If you know that there's a fuller form of their name, you can include it as a separate element, but it's not required. So that's another change. There's qualifiers with personal names. So whereas before we might have said, you know, the abbreviation for reverend, now we would just say they're a clergyman. Keep it kind of general. Again, you don't have to include these qualifiers in your records, but you may see RDA records with those qualifiers in them. Something new with RDA is the uh, concept of family. Previously, it was just treated and established as subject headings, but now you can see that you can have a royal house, a dynasty, or just a family, and use that as an access point or, a, or what we used to call a heading. Another change is fictitious persons can be creators. So you can have Sherlock Holmes in a 100 field, um, or other fictitious characters such as PDQ Bach. A change in thinking from AECR2. Another change, I love this phrase, real non-human entities can be creators, such as our previous president's pet, who told his story to someone and ended up getting an access point. The handling of pseudonyms is very similar to AECR2. Um, if they write under their, their um, pseudonym, then that's what we use. Doesn't matter what their real name is, we use what they write because again, we transcribe what we see rather than correcting it. For series, we record it as it appears on the item. Um, we transcribe it as it's found. So if we see volume, we're going to spell that out. Um, if there's a Roman numeral, that's what we're going to use. So again, we're, we're sticking with what you see on the item rather than what we think it should be with RDA. If you um, include it on 830, a series added access point, you're going to follow the established form of the series. And you see that the um, international standard serial number, um, ISSN, might be at the end of the 830 field. And you just use standard capitalization um, for, for the entry. Parallel titles can be taken from anywhere. And if it's from a source that's not the preferred source, i.e., if you don't find it on the book, but you find it, say, on the publisher's website or in their catalog, you don't have to put it in square brackets. You just put it in as, as the parallel title. Compilations, collaborations. Here's something that, that seems that RDA, RDA is taking a lot of time with. 
talking about when it's a compilation and when it's a collaboration. So a compilation would be all by the same creator. Collaborations would have multiple creators. Um, so basically, you presume it's a collaboration if there's nothing that says who created what. And if you have any doubt, you presume it's a collaboration. So now I'm just going to give you some hints on how to identify RDA mark records. If you look at the mark record and you see an I in, in the descript field and in the O4O, a subfield E is RDA, then you have an RDA record. Also, you can, if you have the 336, 337, and 338 fields, you have an RDA record, as you can see here. So these are, these are hints that you can look for. Another thing you can look at, RDA has that strength on conveying relationships. Um, what I mentioned when we talked briefly about Ferber, the work, the expression, the manifestation, and the item. You can see in here motion picture adaptation of the work. So it actually goes back into that Ferber stuff with our RDA. So kind of why I, I touch on it briefly with with um, in our talk about RDA. So you can understand that's why that word work is there to tell you what about that relationship. In this particular record, it's for four musical works. And you'll see them that they list them up at the top in the 245. All four are listed. There's no collective title. And the first composer is not given a preferred access point. This is the top half of the record. And down here, you can see the relationship designators, the composers, the instrumentalists. So th these are hints that it's RDA. So taking that in mind, this is a record. And you can say to yourself, is this an RDA record? And I'm going to tell you that if you answered yes, you are correct. We have the subfield E. We have the copyright symbol in the 264. We have pages and illustrations spelled out. And we have those three new fields. So again, we'll try that again. You look at this record, and you say to yourself, is this an RDA record? And if you look at it and you said, yes, this is an RDA record, you are right. There's pages. And although it doesn't have the 336, 337, 338 in the display, content, media, and carrier are the words that go along with those three new fields. And so they are shown here. And this is another record. And you, again, can look at this and, and a mark display rather than the OPAC display and think, is this an RDA record? And if you said yes, you would be right. The O40 has that subfield E. Pages is spelled out, and there are those three new records. So applying it a little bit more, here's a question for you. Do the instructions in AACR2 form the basis for what we have in RDA? And you think back on, on the handouts I gave you and the things that I've said, and you can think, is that true or is it false? And I will tell you that it's true. AACR2 forms the basis for RDA. There's a lot of changes, but the underlying foundation of RDA is from AACR2. Is RDA format neutral? Well, if you think about it, it is. Um, we don't care what the format is. We care about the content. Is it the Lord of the Rings? Is it Hamlet? Is it Star Wars? Is it a textbook? It's not so much is it an ebook? Is it a DVD? And under AACR2, that was important to know which chapter to look into. Should RDA records contain a general material designator? Well, I hope you got this one right, because they should not. That's one of the main things that bothers a lot of catalogers, is that that field was removed with RDA. Touched briefly on compilations and collaborations. So here's a... a facsimile title page for a book. Um, do you think that's a collaboration or a compilation? Well, if you said that it's a compilation, you would be correct. 
because all the works are by the same author. Here's another example. Title, there's the title page at the top and then what's listed on the verso. Seeing this, do you think this is a collaboration or a compilation? Well, again, if you said collaboration, you would be right because there are multiple creators listed on that verso of the title page. Are you still having trouble thinking in RDA? I think we all do at some point in time. So this lists some resources that you can use to um, get some more information about RDA. And this slide here provides um, some good books that you can use if you want to learn more about RDA. Um, there are tools to assist you with RDA. The RDA Toolkit is the online subscription resource to use when you're cataloging with RDA. And then we have the RDA in many metadata formats. It's a free tool that can help you think in RDA. It can be very useful. We talked about a background, some terminology, the different parts of the MARC record that have been um, changed with RDA, um, new fields and such. We went through some sample records and asked you some questions about uh, collaborations and compilations. And I showed you some resources. And now we get to that question side. I can't see the questions, but if you have questions, you have a raise your hand icon that you can use. And Chuck, who's hiding in the background, um, can then let me know what your question is, and I can try to answer it. Or have I so overwhelmed you, you don't can't think straight to provide me with a question? I sure hope not. Uh, there hasn't had been a question yet. So. Oh. Well, we still have a few minutes, so you have time to think and see if there's something that you'd like some more information about. I'm hearing crickets. <laughs> well, you do have the handouts. And um, I, do you, Chuck, do you have a way to put that PDF of my presentation up? or? or um, I yeah, I think at this point, um, I'm going to try to attach it to the original entry where it appears on our website. OK. Um, so that way, it's there. Um, I also will link, because this is being recorded for YouTube as well. So I will, when I have it posted, post the link to the uh, presentation YouTube as well on that same page. So hopefully, it'll all be in the same location together. Excellent. That way, you know, if you want to go back and look at those links to the RDA resources or the books, you'll have that opportunity to be able to do so. All right. Uh, I have a question. This is Yay. from Nancy. Um, she says, given your experience, do you find users confused by the mix of, of RDA and non-RDA records in your catalog? Actually, that's a good question. Um, I actually haven't because our catalog is, is is very much a mix. We have not done any retrospective conversion to RDA records for our old records. Um, but they seem to be able to find what they need to find or they come and get us to help them find it. But I haven't really seen any confusion um, with how some, some of them say, you know, 371p and others say, you know, 229 pages. Maybe other people have other experiences, but that's been mine. Okay. I hope that answered your question. Any other questions? <laughs> Nothing so far. Well, I apologize for that phone ringing in the background on me. Oh. Hey, uh, Nancy continues uh, and says that we have a music library. So thinking about those differences. Oh, yes. That, see, that might, that's something I don't have a lot of experience with. So if you have a, a lot of 
music catalog, they may see a difference there. That might be uh, one place to think about whether if you were going to do a retrospective conversion, that's where I might be more likely to consider it sooner rather than later. But I, I, again, um, it's a good thought. I don't have a good answer for you, Nancy. I'm sorry. Nothing more so far. <laughs> I know that there's music librarian um, listservs. That would probably be a really good question to bring up and, and something that's a little bit more specialized to that particular um, clientele. All right, so far, no further questions. OK. Uh, before we wrap it up, I would like to say, too, that you'll be getting a, a follow-up follow -up email, which will contain a link to a survey. So please, if you would, um, fill out the survey for us, just to let us know how we're doing with this. Um, if you think of questions later, there's my contact information, and I do have a library guide with a lot of RDA resources available. You're happy to take a look at. That URL is here. Again, this will be available to you, as Chuck mentioned. All right. Sounds great. I think that's all for today. Thanks, Denise. Welcome, and thanks, everyone, for showing up. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day. Thank you.